I'm definitely encouraged by the words of that song, no matter what. His love is just beyond our comprehension. No matter what, He loved us while we were yet sinners. No matter what, He calls us each and every time we make a mistake and return to Him. Seeking forgiveness and reconciliation, no matter what. The love of God is unlike any other love that the, is known in all of the universe. And how privileged we are to have a man, manifestation of this love through the death and suffering of Jesus Christ, our Savior. A price so precious, a ransom price beyond our comprehension for us, no matter what. Uh, praise God. But let's just take on an attitude of prayer. Father, we just thank you for the encouragement that we've received through the praise and worship, and we know it's because you inhabit the praises of your people. Oh, Holy Spirit, remain with us. Our hearts are open to receive this word, and we ask that you would anoint it. That upon receipt of it, the eyes of our understanding might be opened. That our love for you might be strengthened. And that you might reveal to us a new part of yourself. We just thank you and praise you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Sticking with the book of Ephesians this morning, uh, turn with me, if you will, to the second chapter, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of His Holy Word. Just one more verse in your hearing. For He is our peace who had made both groups one. And this is actually the operative verse this morning. And has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall. Thank you, Lord. When I was a missionary in Kenya, I had a friend, his name was Heron. And he said to me, shortly after my wife and I were married and moved there together, many of you know we lived there for three years, he said, when you have kids, then you'll be married. Heron had nine children. Perhaps he was teasing me, perhaps not. Perhaps he was alluding to the fact, and you can laugh if you want to this morning, that when I did have kids, then the hairs in my head would start to become gray and white. You know, my wife said to me recently, you get haircuts a lot. And I said, because the white hairs on my head are just coming in quicker than the browns did. But to whatever extent, it was part of Kenyan culture that a marriage was cemented when the couple gave birth to their first child. Unbeknownst to me, this was an invisible barrier because Heron had children. And so, according to his custom, he was married, but the newlyweds did not. And so their relationship, according to that custom wasn't yet completely fulfilled. As I lived there, I became more aware of these invisible barriers. The differences between tribes creates great animosity between them. And if two people fall in love, just like the Montagues and Capulets of old from different tribes, it's frowned upon. And that couple can, in fact, be persecuted greatly even in this hour that we live in, this contemporary society that we're a part of. Two of my best friends were from different tribes. And the woman, being from a different tribe, lived in the husband's tribal area and received great persecution for just being of a different tribe. It was an invisible barrier that I was unaware of. And as I lived there for some time, I can recall my wife and I eating at town lunch one day as we went into town shopping and there being some other white people there we were living there for probably about two years at that point and my wife and I asked one another sincerely what are those white people doing here we had become so accustomed to the culture that we considered ourselves Kenyans not white missionaries and we became so assimilated 
within the culture that now we were the ones on the opposite side of the barrier asking, what are these missionaries? What is their business here? We're familiar with these invisible barriers in our society also. Sorrowfully, in the last few years, the news has been filled with the invisible barrier of race, people rising up against one another just because their color of their skin was different. In this part of the world, there are also cultural barriers. Italians declare that their food is the best. The Irish people say, you can't cook potatoes like me. And we combat over these silly things, these in invisible barriers on who's the best, who has the greatest tradition, the greatest national pride. And while I think it's important to have some pride in our lineage, I don't think it's appropriate for us to look down on somebody else just because they're different, just because they have a different background or a different nationality. These barriers are apparent all around us. That's one of the marvelous things about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He came to unite all people, regardless of their race, or their background, or their heritage, or their nationality, under one banner of love. And He brought together all of these people, the Apostle John declares in the book of Revelation, before the throne of the Lamb, in one day, every knee will bow from every tribe, nation, people, and tongue and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a fantastic sight. But more, what a miraculous miracle that Jesus was the one person, the one God in all of the universe that was able to bring together all different types of people with all different sorts of background, to fall in love with the same Savior. He broke down, Paul says, the barrier walls between us, broke down the racial tensions, broke down the nationality differences, broke down the cultural barriers. When He took our sins upon Him, and He suffered and died in our place upon the tree. These people that declared the Lamb of God the Savior of the world may have had differences on earth, but those differences were put asunder through and by the love of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul speaks of great barriers that were broken down by Christ. And I believe that before we're to, to discuss how he went about breaking down this barrier, spiritually, we must first be aware that barriers exist. Herod made known to me that there was a barrier between I and him. And when I lived abroad, I became aware of all of these barriers and several that we've discussed this morning. But you know there are spiritual barriers. And all of these other differences that I've discussed, they're really not that important. But there's one barrier that's everlasting, and that's the spiritual barrier the great divide between heaven and earth. The divide between that which belongs to God and that which does not. In Eden, there was no barrier. Adam and Eve lived in the garden and enjoyed harmony with God as they walked with God in obedience. But sin entered into the world. And this sin created a great barrier. And this barrier was personified for us when Adam and Eve were dispelled from the garden and God protected the way with two cherubim with flaming swords. A barrier that man could not bypass. A barrier that was placed there by heaven and created by God Himself. An enmity unlike any other that the universe had ever seen. And man who had once lived in harmony with God in Eden was now dispelled forever, but for the promise. God made a promise. He said that the, the, the man, that the earth was cursed, that the serpent was cursed, and would wiggle on his belly all the days of his life. 
But God also promised that he would send a seed. A seed that would be planted in the heart, in the womb of a woman. A seed that would be planted and bring forth the Messiah. And by this seed, the enmity, the great barrier caused by sin would be destroyed. God began fulfillment of this promise when he called Abraham from Ur. And when you study Abraham and his life in the nation of Israel generally, are you not studying a metaphor for the Christian life? Israel who was greatly persecuted. Christians, the Bible says, will suffer nakedness, hardship, persecution, danger, and the sword. Israel who wandered through the wilderness like a vagabond, sleeping in tents. Does not our soul inhabit the tent of this body? Are not Christians gathered all over the globe? Not gathered unto one place, but scattered and dispersed. Much like Israel, the nation called in the apple of God's eye. When we study Abraham's life, we know he was called from his father's house. Just like Christ was sent from his father's house. Abraham was called to begin a new nation. Just like Christ was sent to begin a new nation called Christians over all the earth. This people that God called through Abraham were a peculiar people. Why were they peculiar? Because they were unlike any other nation in all of the earth. Other nations would gather and serve many gods, but Israel was called to serve one God. Other nations would make golden images after the gods that they served. Israel made no such images because the Lord thy God is one. Israel didn't have a nation to call their own until they entered the promised land. God spoke through the patriarchs and the prophets. This nation of Israel was filled with great wisdom and it was Joseph that went down into Egypt and by the wisdom of God preserved the whole earth in a time of great famine. For 400 years, you would think that by Israel living in Egypt that there would be some type of integration that took place. But it didn't occur. Why didn't it occur? It didn't occur because there was a barrier between this holy people that God set aside and the Egyptians. One might ask the question, why did God go to all of this business of delivering through the ten plagues Israel from Egypt? Why didn't he just overthrow Egypt and allow Israel to live and abide there? Did not he also take the firstborn? And the answer is very simple. The answer is because God never planned for Israel to live in Egypt. God never intended them to remain there. 430 years unto the day that Israel entered Egypt, they were delivered according to the promise of God. But while they were there, they learned, and they multiplied, and they increased. The Bible says, even to the point where they almost outnumbered the Egyptians. And in the process of time, when it, when it was time for them to be delivered, God sent Moses, the Savior, to bring them out of Egypt do you know God doesn't intend us to live in Egypt either? The Christian who is called by God doesn't feel comfortable in Egypt. I believe that Israel didn't feel comfortable either. I believe that from generations they passed on the story of Abraham. You know, one day we're going to inherit the promised land, one flowing with milk and honey because God promised us Oh, I can just see the old rabbis sitting down with the children, sharing with them the promise of God. One day we'll leave this heavy burden place where we work by the set of our brow with rigor. One day we'll leave this place and we won't be building pyramids for the taskmasters that rule over us, but we'll be building our houses where we can live and raise our children. I believe Israel was always uncomfortable in Egypt. And I believe that Christians, if they are Christians, are uncomfortable in the world. If you're a Christian this morning, you don't feel comfortable in the world. 
The laws of the world make you restless. This contemporary society that promotes how far it's advanced from generations by and by somehow offends you. In a social gathering, when you're with non-Christians, you feel out of sorts. To the extent you want to fellowship with them, it's to fellowship in order to share the gospel, to share the love of Christ, to bring them some hope or encouragement, to bait them out of the world by the love of Christ, to share with them something that, make, that, that will make them too feel uncomfortable in Egypt. You see, there's a bar there was a barrier between Israel and Egypt, and there's a barrier for you if you're a Christian between you and unbelievers. We can hypothesize and read the scriptures when we try to imagine the barriers that existed between Israel and Egypt, but Paul sets forth very clearly in this writing the difference between the believer in the unbeliever. He says that the, the unbeliever is the old man that is dead. The unbeliever is dead. Though he may be rich, he is dead. Though he may have a lucrative job, he is dead. Though his children may sit around his table every evening and eat supper, he's dead. Though he may laugh from one morning to the next, he's dead. Though he may eat, drink, and be merry, Paul says this old man is dead because he has not yet dealt with this invisible barrier called death. The barrier that existed as soon as Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden tree. And dear friend, if that barrier has not been dealt with in your life, though you feel alive, God would conclude you are dead. Paul also says, this living man, this old man is living for the age of this world. He's a contemporary man. He feels at home in the world. He longs to live in the world. He loves to be a part of the world. It's progressiveness and it's prosperity. And because he loves it, he vehemently defends it as any national would. Have you ever met Somebody so in love with the world, when you present to them the light of the gospel, though they live in darkness, they defend it with every atom of their being. Even when you present the truth of Christ, the truth of the gospel, the truth of life, the truth of love, and the truth of the fact that if they do not confess their sins and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that they're the barrier of sin and death cannot be removed. They sit opposed to it, vehemently defending their wrongfulness. Third, Paul says the old man is obedient to the prince of the air, Satan, who works in the son of disobedience. And if God the Father work through His Son, and if everything that Christ did was according to His perfect will, and if Christians that are walking obediently to God are also bringing, in, bringing the manifestation of God's will into the earth by the power of the Holy Spirit, does it not follow that this old man who is dead, who is defending this, this old age, is walking according to the obedience of the wicked serpent. This degradation in society is being propelled and motivated by sons of disobedience. The degradation of life, of marriage, of holiness, of the gospel, of the scriptures, the persecution of believers in the body of Christ can all be attributed to the same source, this old man on the other side of Eden, the other side of the barrier, serving after the lust of his flesh according to disobedience is propagating not the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of the earth and the kingdom of the evil one. How is this barrier broken? Abraham lived in earth. He lived on the other side of the barrier. But how was this barrier broken? It was broken by faith 
in God. Over Abraham walked by faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And the faith that Abraham had, and the exercise of it, positioned him in a place where the enmity and the barrier can be destroyed. By faith, a, the, the barrier was brought down. And by our faith in Jesus Christ, this barrier of sin is brought down. Paul says, but for, oh, this but for moment. But for, here's grace. But God, here's the turning point of every testimony of one where the barrier has been brought down. But God, these are the words that cause every old man to become a new man. But God, all oh, believers, just praise God for your own testimony. The words for every person that was caught in bondage on one side of the barrier, but God, the barrier being brought down, moving into a new life with Christ Jesus. But God, I was a drunkard. But God, I was a murderer. I was a thief. But God in His mercy brought down the barrier wall that stood between me and Him. But God is the turning point. Oh, where, are, where is your heart stand before God this morning? Are you on the opposite side of the barrier? Are you in Egypt and you need to come out? The opposite side of Eden with the flaming swords of the cherubim before you. The opposite side of the cross Railing him with accusations, but God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is he speaking to you right now? Is this a turning point where God is moving in your life? But God. Oh, the power of heaven. How only Christ has the power to bring down the barrier of sin and death. And this great enmity that existed between God and man was defeated through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said it was broken. Oh, I love that word. I love that description. If I, if I tear down a wall, if I disassemble that wall, you may suggest that he's taking apart that wall piece by piece and numbering each and every block because he has an intention of building it somewhere else. But Paul says that Jesus came to break this barrier. He didn't disassemble it. You know, sometimes within the body of Christ, doctrinally speaking, we view Christianity as some kind of rehabilitation. Christ never came to rehabilitate us. He didn't come to rehabilitate the old man, to fix the old man. He came to just break the old man and crucify it to the tree with himself so that a newborn might a new man might be reborn through the power of the resurrection oh and herein lies the deceit of the enemy because if the holy spirit is speaking to your heart right now and if you're on the hinge and if your testimony if the page of your life is about to turn in that but god moment the enemy of your soul is speaking to you and saying, but how can you get out of Egypt? How can you get out of Egypt? How can you rehabilitate yourself? Israel, look all around you. Look at the grandeur of this contemporary society. Look at the silver and the gold and the high palaces and the pyramids. How are you, slave nation, going to overthrow this great giant? A metaphor not unlike the desperate soul kneeling before the cross, feeling the weight and the burden of the barrier called sin. How can I defeat this alcoholism? How can I defeat this fornication? How can I defeat this great sin? It's a giant warring against me, a great barrier wall. We're called apostles at the gate called beautiful. But the man who could not walk, he said, silver and gold, I have none. But what I have I give. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. 
This barrier wall is not brought down, in other words, by the grandeur of this life, but it's brought down by our faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. The great shepherd who took the stone of his life and slayed the great giant called sin and Satan and death in this world with one fatal shot, the death of the Son of God upon the cross. How does this barrier wall come down? How is sin in your life defeated? Only through Jesus Christ who came and broke the wall. He broke the barrier down. Before Israel entered the promised land, oh, you've all read this since, since Sunday school, what needed to happen? The walls of Jericho needed to come down, but not one Israelite raised a hammer or a chisel against the brick. They didn't disassemble it so as to resurrect it and defend them once they entered the walls against foreign nations. No, they walked obediently around the walls seven times until the walls came crumbling down. Jesus Christ came to break down the barrier wall in our life. Oh, is there one here? Is there one here who must and needs of necessity to put their faith in Jesus Christ? In the Old Testament days, to be counted among Israel, the males needed to be circumcised. There must have been a shedding of blood. Foreigners could, and servants could enter in to this beloved people, this promised people who were walking through the world if they, if they shed their blood. But this New Testament sacrifice called grace and mercy, this New Testament sacrifice called the blood of Christ requires us to merely put our faith in the blood that was already shed. Oh, people of God, can you see His wisdom? How do I know the difference between the Israelite and the Egyptian? Only in the blood. How do I know the difference between the Christian and the unbeliever? Only in the blood. Our blood is not after the lineage of our parents, nor the nationality, nor the heritage. But those of us that are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ have received the transfusion. And we're not counted any longer among the sons of men, but among the sons of God. What happens when he breaks down this wall? Is he begins to rebuild us. And Paul says in this very same chapter, he says, You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Let the flesh of your own body bear, bear testimony of the new life in you. Is God not able to create a human being? Does not his knowledge possess the workmanship to create a human being in Eden after his image and likeness and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and give man the power within his own seed to propagate Thousands of years later, billions and billions and billions of people have lived according to the handiwork of God. Does not He also therefore possess the workmanship to rebuild you? And if the workmanship of our human nature began in the image of God, does not the workmanship of our spiritual nature, is it not after the image and the likeness of the Son of God? Is that not the work of the Holy Spirit within you who are saved? Was not the workmanship of God beyond, behind everything that Israel did? A pillar of fire before them. A pillar of cloud behind them. A tabernacle in the wilderness, a place to worship them. And thousands of years later after that, man Abram was called from Ur. Though the enemy of its soul and though nation upon nation has tried to destroy Israel, they've been unsuccessful because they are God's chosen people. So it is with you. God's chosen people. And this is the effect of this barrier wall being broken. You're no longer strangers or foreigners, but citizens of the beautiful city. Or 
were citizens of heaven. We're citizens of God. We may be inhabiting the earth for a season, but just like Christ, who was just wandering through, we're just wandering through, being used by God's Holy Spirit, walking in obedience, a light here or there, bringing joy where the Holy Spirit leads us, bringing love, bringing the hope of the gospel. Because the barrier wall has been broken down and Christ has begun to build you up in the Spirit. And that's what you'll take with you. You won't take with you the grandeur of this life. You won't take with you your house that you've built, nor the garden that you've planted. But what you will take with you is the way that you've been built by the Holy Spirit to mirror and reflect the image of His perfect Son, who is our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, as the Word just settles into our heart, and as the choir sings the invitation, we ask ourselves honestly, is there a barrier between us and you? Is the old man trying to rule and reign supreme in our lives? This old man of sin, this old man of disobedience, who loves the earth, and defends his ways. Does Satan have a hold of us? Somewhere in our hearts. Is there a barrier. That needs to be broken. Dear friend I can attest. You can frustrate yourself. By trying to discipline that barrier. By trying to. Climb over it. Or dig under it. But that barrier must be broken. It must be broken by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, in Him alone. It takes faith to view the crushed body of our Savior upon the tree. But can you view it now in light of the fact that it was crushed because sin was crushed? That it was crushed and His blood poured out, all of it, because the barrier was being demolished. The Bible says when Jesus commended His Spirit into the Father's hand, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom as a metaphor that we have access to God the Father. The barrier was brought down the moment that Jesus Christ died. And that's the moment that we need to enter in to by faith to be born again. The barrier coming down through repentance. The barrier coming down by being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, is there one within the sound of my voice that needs a blood transfusion? Is there one right now asking you to bring all the barriers down? Lord, we confess our sins because you're able and you're just to forgive us. We want nothing between us and you. We invite you into our heart right now to be our Lord and Savior and we ask you to clean out this space of the old man. Clean it out through the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. We give our lives to you. Come into our hearts. Be our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we ask you sincerely by our own free will, begin the process of rebuilding us in the Spirit. Abraham began as one but multiplied exceedingly and abundantly. God promised so that his heirs could not be numbered, even as the stars of the sands could not be counted. 
And from this one life, Christ, who was born infamously in a manger in Bethlehem, from this one life, this one obedience, this one perfection, came the multiplication of the Christian family. How privileged we are to be a member of the body of Christ. How it's been multiplied by faith throughout the entire world. And when we view ourselves through the eyes of the Spirit, Father, we're uncomfortable in this place. We know that we don't belong here. We know it's just temporary. Our hearts are not set upon it. We don't defend it. But what we do defend is this Holy Word and our blessed Savior. Because we're citizens of heaven. The barrier has been broken down. The flaming swords placed in their sheath. And you who have accepted Christ by faith. Oh, I pray that the Holy Spirit allows you to tangibly feel the embrace of your heavenly Father. Who says, welcome home. I welcome you not as a foreigner. Nor as a servant, but as a son and a daughter. Because you've put your faith in the one who's more valuable to me than anyone in all the universe, my own son. Oh Lord, it's good to have you be a part of our life. May we long for and endeavor to serve you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The closing hymn this morning, hymn number 133, moment by moment. Let's make it a prayer this morning as we close.